Welcome to the Conscious Resistance. I'm here with my next guest, Cal Molinet. How are you doing today? I'm doing so well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to talk to you. I've heard a lot about and seen a lot of your work, so I'm excited to see what kind of things we can get into and to spread your message. You are the founder of Liberate uh, RVA, is that correct? Uh, yeah, and I guess I, w- I couldn't take sole credit. Uh, I started off with uh, my girlfriend, a friend of mine, uh, one of my best friends, and this, uh, I guess before I officially, officially called it Liberate RVA, I spent months like tr- trying to talk about anarchism for them. For um, I mean, they had a lot of really great questions, so I would say it kind of started with uh, with those two. Um, before I started to branch off and then finally just uh, penning it as a Liberate RVA. Awesome. And so what type of action or what type of focus does does your group have? Uh, it's, it's, uh, I guess uh, quite a variety of different areas. Um, and not so much that uh, uh, give us a recognition that there's a lot of people, a lot of working families, uh, a lot of people who have the 9 to 5 jobs who can't uh, sometimes take an hour off, you know, to attend, uh, you know, um, a gathering or a rally or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's mostly, uh, as a friend would uh, pen it, uh, Rachel would pen it as a, you know, revolution of convenience. Um, because at the, same, at the same time, you know, you look in the past where a lot of the the activism kind of always catered to, to the lower class. Um, I myself am part of the lower class, but at the same time, uh, you don't open it up to the people who, who need that 9 to 5, who are living paycheck to paycheck and don't really have the time um, that they would like to um, invest in, in a lot of this kind of activism. Um, and so, for the most part, what I do in trying to encourage um, a lot of my, my friends here now is to just try to spread in your own interpersonal relationships. Um, if you have a girlfriend, if you have a husband, a, a friend, best friend, start off right there at home. And, uh, and if anything, invite them to the Freedom Gathering so we can kind of continue the discussion here. So it's mostly a uh, trying to have these conversations one person at a time. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Your, your focus from your videos seems to be getting out there and, as you said, getting the, the conversations going. I really enjoy that because I often try to remind uh, listeners, viewers, and uh, fellow activists that the revolution is in the conversations. It's in the day-to-day activities that we're doing with our families, with our friends, with our loved ones. And we're coming off of Thanksgiving here in America where we have all sorts of opportunity to uh, create conversation and create dialogue on anarchy, on freedom, on self-rule, and of course on just a number of important topics that are happening in our world today. So I appreciate the uh, the tactic that you do there because it, it is important for us to break down those barriers. And often, as I'm sure you've realized, when you get out there and you just start talking to people, you, you find common ground and you see their, their minds sort of taking in the information, whether it's something uh, involving anarchy or a specific current event, you see them turning it over in their mind and really thinking about it. And often it can create either cognitive dissonance where they're going to reject it uh, out of programming or they might actually say, you know what, I've never thought about it that way and, and you can really create change. So what, what has your experience been going out to the streets and how long have you been doing that type of activism? Uh, well, I guess I've been doing it now for a little over a year now. I started um, last year in May, and uh, my, the first sign I had was uh, asked me how voting is immoral. Um, before now, I'm trying a different sign, which I've got a lot more better interest in, asked me how government is immoral. And uh, to kind of invite the question, um, you know, I, you came to me, I didn't come to you, I'm not in your face, I'm not yelling at you, I'm not uh, antagonizing you. And so it's uh, the conversation, for the most part, people who do come and, uh, and talk are people from out of curiosity or out of humor, which is great places to, to start from, you know, in, in terms of conversation. Uh, so you kind of remove some of the barriers of entry to discussion, especially with something as uh, complicated as anarchism. It doesn't have to be complicated, but, you know, if it was easy, you know, then you know, everyone will be doing it. Um, but so it, you kind of have to remove some of the defenses that people kind of have towards um, new ideas uh, is to kind of lodge the, uh, as you called it, the, um, uh, not the uh, Stockholm Syndrome, not the Stockholm Syndrome aspect of it, but cognitive dissidence mm-hmm. um, and trying to launch that out of it. And most people feel comfortable if they feel like they're still owning their own conversation and owning their own arguments. I'm not making you feel wrong. I'm not making you feel, you know, uh, like it's your fault. Um, I'm not calling people status. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, um, I appreciate that, man. A, a yeah. lot of activists will get stuck in the mentality of us versus them, and as you know, that only breeds further uh, division. 
yeah. whether we're calling people statists or sheeple or whatever your choice word may be, it doesn't really, I would say for me personally, and obviously you've come to the same conclusion, it doesn't really serve our purposes in the long run. Right. You're, you're diagnosing. Um, and you, you've yet to provide them an opportunity to understand, uh, I guess, the situation around them for them to conclude on their own uh, where they do want to stand. And so for the most part, it's trying to encourage dialogue and conversation. So, you know, if you have more questions, I'm here tomorrow, come to our freedom gathering. Um, you know, maybe you might not understand a lot of these concepts, that's fine, but at least the conversation is going um, in a rational point that no one feels threatened. And it's mostly towards uh, a discussion to get a, to a better place, not to throw more wood in a fire, uh, so to speak. And what type of responses do you generally get? I mean, do you feel you're, uh, you're gaining ground in your area, or do you run into uh, some conflict? Right. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, when I first started doing this, I thought I would, I would get a lot of, you know, fuck you, get the fuck out of here, or, you know, um, I thought I would get a lot of hostility, and, and I haven't. Um, it was very, it's kind of been easygoing. A lot of people in the beginning, all right, that kind of makes sense, interesting. I've, I've met a lot of friends through that. Um, and along the way, I guess, um, doing this for quite a while, getting better at it, improving, uh, refining my rhetoric, and uh, finding different ways to, for, I guess, to introduce different ideas in that, you know, elevator talk I have maybe for five or ten minutes uh, up before they go to another class. So sometimes I feel rushed, so it's a lot of interesting experiences that you can't substitute. And so for the most part, it's all been very, very positive. Uh, so I usually start off with three questions. Uh, they, well, they're all pretty much the same questions, pretty much asking if they, uh, you know, I guess the initiation of violence, and they always agree that it's wrong, it's immoral. So we start off uh, as a starting point, you know, um, before I can go to the complex, um, I guess, areas of anarchism, you know, we have to kind of agree on some certain terms. And so otherwise, I've, I've always found myself, if I start off talking about anarchism, before I set it up, uh, yeah, things do go all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and then I feel like I have to, like, I, I'm like, trying to answer questions all, all over the world here. And whereas I found a way to kind of set it up uh, and preemptively answer a lot of those questions before finally we can get to, like, what are your thoughts now? Um, now that we've painted the brush of what the state looks like and now we've painted the brush and, and the picture of what, what is the state and that the only way that the state only knows how to use uh, solve problems is through violence. And then after that, the conversations get a lot easier. Um, after that, it's... Um, I haven't even had any, any problems, except for maybe a communist. Uh, <laughs> usually communists are usually the ones I've had problems with, but like uh, talking with like maybe 100 people now, there's maybe three communists I came across. Um, one of them, his way of um, solving the problems in the world is through murdering the rich, and uh, the other one is still through government. Um, so I've had another communist kind of concede as like, kind of like an apologetic communist, but uh, for the most part, that's really it. So not surprisingly, right? You know, communists is like, nah, you can, you can, you don't have to believe in property rights, right? I won't force this idea onto you. As long as it's voluntary, you can live in a community, you can, whatever experiment you want to live in or, or, or try. Um, but the, I guess the, the division line is, you know, are you going to violently force those ideas onto someone else? Is it can that can someone who lives in your community voluntarily leave if they wanted to, right? Um, and for the most part, most of the communists, I've, like most, only three, um, I've come across, uh, they would initiate violence. They, they are supportive of the state. Um, the only way for them to solve this violence of, of the state is through more violence. So, Yeah, you know, that's, I'm, I want to touch on that in just a second. And I think it's, a, it's important, as you said, that when you go out there and you start communicating with people, your dialogue, your rhetoric, uh, you, it gets sharper. You know, you're... I was watching a video here a few moments ago where you were giving out tips for people on uh, what to do and how to get involved in communicating with people on the street. And it's definitely not for everyone. Sometimes it's uh, you got to be quick on your feet when you're conversating with somebody. As, as I'm sure you know, you, they say one thing and you're instantly thinking of how you can turn that into uh, something positive. And I, and I agree with you that if you don't set up the, uh, the, the conversation to let people understand these ideas without first talking to them about anarchy – they're going to come in with all their preconceived notions on what they think anarchy means and this and that. And I've been more and more personally shifting away from this branding of anarchism as far as, you know, the colors and the, the right you know, nice. scene, nice. the right wording, because I tend to feel that, as you know, that good ideas don't require violence and they also don't require us to beat people over the head and say, anarchy's right, anarchy's right. Like, as, what you're doing with your work is you're going out and you're having conversations with people um, and you're getting them to understand these ideas, which are which we can call anarchy and anarchism, 
but without having to tell them like this is you know where this flag or where this right color they just understand it in principle they're like wow i guess i haven't really thought about that oh by the way this is called anarchy and you know that makes it a bit easier you, you don't you don't create walls there by saying well we're the anarchists on this side and you guys are the opposite we can create a dialogue and on the uh, the communist left there I, I wanted to to go further with that because i watched that video as well where you're saying those are some of the main opposition that you've run into and again only three people there but that's been my experience as well not specifically just communists but for better uh, you know for lack of better terminology those on the left who see some of the same problems we do but in the end their uh, solutions involve some sort of, uh, sort of violence or force I mean what do you what do you feel is is there a solution is there a way for us to really bridge that gap or is that like you know the the our I kind of our, our parting point you know we can come up to certain points but then when it comes to like well at the end of the day and this is a this is a quote that I've heard from somebody who I respect who is on the left and a very well known community organizer who said well at the end of the day if those capitalists try to maintain property we will shoot them things like that I mean like right. those are pretty strong statements and I, where, what, what solutions can we get from that well I, I guess uh, the first thing to I guess understand right off the bat is that they're no different from the government it's no different from the state. So whether they call themselves a communist or a fascist, it really doesn't matter. That you, you get the same kind of threat from government. <laughs> yeah. um, technically, you can't own any property because of government. You know, through eminent domain, to property taxes. Uh, so technically, the state isn't even there to protect your property. Uh, so technically, you you don't even own, you can't even own your own body, right? You know. Um, so a lot of the stuff there. Are, so their their threats are kind of empty, anyways, because they're already realized in the situation in the world around us. You know, we, we live that in our day to day life. So for for the most part, I found that. Um, I guess with a lot of these people, I, I just have like a common phrase like, well, you know, hopefully one day you let go of the idea that violence was so free, take good care, I'm going to go talk to someone else who's a lot more interested, right? Um, you know, I, here's a pamphlet, you know, if you have interested in uh, more discussions and conversations, sure, we can have this. Um, but right now, you know, I, I'm out here to, to do something, I'm out here to, to find people who are already waiting to, to be free, you know, willing to be free, waiting to, to hear something uh, outside of, you know, the mainstream, outside of from, um, you know, I found them for the most part, people do understand there is something wrong with the government there's i haven't found anyone that's like you know all praise the state and uh there's nothing wrong that the state can do and so just mostly sometimes when i talk to people trying to find what is that one piece about the state that they don't like and then we can kind of i can tailor the message towards that particular area um but at the same time you're mentioning about uh, communists and well you're mentioning also the colors and the divisions of uh i guess the way that the factions have kind of separated and my thoughts on that was, um, well, you know, you've had a lifetime, um, people who have been involved in this for, for decades, you know, and, and, and centuries, but, you know, um, to do something with the term anarchy. And it hasn't gone anywhere. Um, it's more, again, more division, more, you know, you're red in the black, you're gold in the black, you're, um, what, pink, green. Um, it's like, look, it hasn't, it hasn't gone anywhere. You know, all the actual plans that all these anarchists in the past have put forward have failed. You know, the fact that you're still a tax slave today implies that all their actual plans have failed. Um, maybe they could have worked, perhaps, in that time and place. Um, maybe you look at, like, Rothbard, for example, and why maybe perhaps he turned political near the end uh, when anarchism is not a political position to begin with. Maybe it was harder for the people in, in that generation to understand the gravity of the situation. Now we're living in 2013, but maybe somebody in the 1970s couldn't see, you know, the... I guess social security, you know, the, the, the weight of that, and that is inevitably going to be unsustainable, or people living in Detroit didn't know that, you know, a couple of decades from now it's going to go into bankruptcy. It was difficult back then for people to see that, which is why maybe perhaps they turned on towards uh, political approaches. Um, but at the same time, that's that's also failed. Um, you know, there are the white knights, uh, Ron Paul, you know, what, three times run around for presidency, failed. Um, and so it's like it, it hasn't worked um, every and for the most part, you look at it objectively in terms of how they try to achieve freedom. Uh, it's always been through either violent means or political means. Both still synonymous. Um, both still the same thing. Um, you know, that's uh, the language of the state disguising violence as politics, right? Um, and that's uh, I, I think for the most part the biggest problem of a lot of this stuff is just uh, not differentiating between these two terms and trying to go at it objectively and non-compromisingly and uh, only because, you know, you compromise in any part of your values, you give an exception to politics or to, to that violence, you allow anyone to, to, you know, to take that and to take that even further. Um, and that's what the state does best, you know, to take those exceptions and 
and then, of course, uh, exacerbated from that and pointed out to, like, again, you know, you're not allowed to steal, we'll call it taxes, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that's been, I've, I've noticed a big problem with uh, a lot of attempts in the past uh, not to define their particular words, to define the words like violence, for example, uh, or, or you have the, uh, the zeitgeist guy who causes structural violence. Um, <laughs> This very abstract, very abstract definitions, abstract meanings, and and that's uh, what they're up against. Um, statists know how to define the words abstract terms even more abstract. And usually, when you're a statist, if you're a statist debating another statist, that's usually whoever has like the most capacity of knowledge of abstract terms usually wins, um, arguing from the effect. So, I feel that uh, we already have something foundational, something rational, something consistent. I think that's. And that's our primary weapon of choice to kind of defeat the, the language uh, or, or the matrix. And I think that's kind of what we have to stick with um, all the way with, with that consistency and not compromising, not, uh, you know, um, creating exceptions here. Yeah, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, the way you put that. And it is important for us to watch our language and to, to be more conscious, more aware of our language, because as you said, there's, there's a lot of abstract terms and these things have guided us for, for quite some time. And, really the way you put it there, that we've let these other anarchists, these other ideas go for some time, and um, they haven't succeeded. You know, some people try to put it the other way and say, well, peaceful revolution hasn't succeeded in thousands of years. But I think the majority of the action that's taken place through uh, through the, the mind of the the average person is conducted with violence. You know, they, they follow the, the line of the state. They follow, uh, or they, like as you said, they go towards partyarchy. Uh, as Konkin called it, and they, they think that they can somehow join the machine and change it from within. I, I tend towards more uh, like Carl Hess, anarchism without hyphens, anarchism without adjectives, the idea that basically we can all recognize these principles that we, uh, you know, we want everyone to have the ability to rule themselves and to, to build community and to s become more self-reliant, self-sufficient, and all these types of things. And if we could build a solid foundation around that, which is, I think, what we're going at here, and then when we get past this enemy of ours, the state, and move to move on to you know greater tasks for humanity, then we can get to the point where, like, okay, now let's allow free experimentation of all these different types of economic schools, and let's see uh, in real time which one of these is going to succeed and which one's going to fail. Will the market uh, bear out and then let communism succeed and take over? And all of a sudden, maybe we'll realize we were wrong, and you know we need to have this communist system. Or you know we're, we're really going to see though if we're allowed to to have free experimentation, and from my experience, that's uh, almost a sin in the eyes of some of these other anarchists or other uh, uh, activists, and not even exclusively to anarchists, but those who still want to use state means, who still want to work within the political system, where they just can't possibly have any group of individuals who want to opt out and want to create something else outside of them. You know, and I've heard that from people, they're like, no, like if I have to pay taxes, then you should have to pay taxes too. You know, if you find some way to live more free, that's not fair. You know, we all have to be subjugated under the same same boot. So it, it is important for us to get out there and to have these conversations because obviously, you know, you're gaining ground here. You Do you, you focus on your part of town? Do you go uh, to the college? Is that what, where you normally are at? Uh, yeah, I focus. Um, I focus a lot at VCU, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. I was a student there. I was a senior last year, uh, studying criminal justice, and uh, I know these these are the particular institutions where a lot of these status ideology are kind of um, further cemented in the minds of a lot of um, as they look at tax cattle of all of us. And so, of course, you instill this kind of um, ideology in those textbooks. You know, they're nothing but lies and propaganda, especially the criminal justice classes. You know, for me, I. I feel like I wasted like a couple of years of my life. It's like I should have maybe gone in the in the arts. You know, that, that's just still deals, deals with abstractions. Great. That's not uh, trying to objectify it. Whereas um, in the areas of social sciences, they've tried to. And so yeah, it's um, I feel for the most part that's. that's I guess for, for me, that's my little battleground. So it's uh, they call it the compass. It's uh, I guess for me to practice the uh, Socratic method, I suppose, and try to talk about philosophy there. Uh, but so, whereas a student who graduates from VCU and has been indoctrinated with a lot of these uh, status beliefs, you know, they, they're the ones who go on to become like the managers, those the supervisors, uh, leading a lot of the, the market forces. So, of course, that's, that's, that's part of the uh, sustainability of statism is right through there, you know, through educating, um, I guess, mis miseducating a lot of the people oh. into understanding what's going on around them. And then they put them out there into the real world, and a lot of those ideologies continue to flourish. So, I feel like 
for the most part, I mean, I can't do this at a regular, you know, high school or whatnot. But, but we actually, we do have um, some members who actually are, uh, who go to the local high school. So they do talk about it there too. Um, but I find it to be, I guess, at the same time, these are the students, these are the areas where they do have enough time to kind of uh, objectively study and cross-examine. Um, whereas if I talk to someone who has a nine to five, you know, coming home tired and working, you know, has to uh, six hours sleep, has to take care of the kids. Um, for the most part, sometimes they don't have enough time to actually, you know, look at the material, study the material. So it's uh, the young adults, for the most part, then who are eventually going to turn to the mothers and fathers and say, you know, let's, we need to have a conversation. They're the ones who are going to have the most effect to, to, I guess, to, to help their parents understand. Um, I mean, not a stranger off the street like me, but in effect, you know, talking to, to those, you know, they'll have an opportunity to talk to their siblings and, and their family. Um, I believe I wanted, oh yeah, well, one, one remark I wanted to say on, um, the, the, I guess the, the red and the black and all that stuff, you know, the different forms of anarchism in the past. Um, my tip for that is just to ignore it. Uh, it hasn't gone anywhere and it, it's, it's never going to go anywhere. So when you have those encounters with the communists, for example, um, just ignore it. You know, they're one person out of, you know, here in Richmond, there's, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, 120,000 people uh, here in the city it, it, by itself. There's, uh, in the greater Richmond, there's like maybe 1.2 million. So that's that's insignificant. You have the rest of the people who've never heard of this division of anarchism, who's never heard of the red and the black, who's never heard of um, any of these order ideologies. So I, I could work with that. Yeah. You know, I'd more sooner to rather talk to someone who's a Republican or uh, a Democrat, you know, I guess a socialist, um, then talk to someone who, who's heard of, um, uh, you know, some of the historic history of, uh, of anarchism or who's heard of, uh, of Ron Paul sometimes, um, I guess, minarchism. And uh, so I, I guess that's pretty much where you, you kind of have to take this message out, you know. Um, you look at it as you would as you're selling any product, selling any meshes. You look at your market and trying to tailor the meshes to the individual um, for each encounter. Yeah, that's a great point there, man. You know, this... Uh this division, I think it's just, for those of us who, whatever way you wake up or become aware, some people fight within political channels. You mentioned Ron Paul a couple times. Some people really thought Ron Paul was going to do it, and they became uh, disenchanted and went on to anarchy. Other people came from the left side of things and then find their, their way over to this side, so to speak. But it is important to to focus on the fact that people understand ideas. You know, As you said, there's not everyone's aware of this division. It can be disheartening to come from mainstream politics and to see the blue and the red and the left and the right and Democrats and Republicans and then to turn around and discover this new ideology and then be like, wow, there's just as much division here. Yeah. But we can move past that, as you said. It's probably not going anywhere anytime soon. I, here in Houston, you know, myself and the Houston Freethinkers, we work alongside a lot of so-called left anarchists and some of them were very uh, instrumental in inspiring us to get going. So we, you know, we come together and we stand together on issues that we can. And then yeah. there's, sometimes we're standing on the opposite side of the street, but it's just about coming together and focusing on those important points. Because I think, as you seem to know and as your work highlights, it's we're past the point of focusing on the problems and focusing on division. It's time to get these ideas out there. It's time to go you know, out there and to communicate with people. And as you said, the, the the younger generation, you know, we also deal with high school kids and people of all ages, really, from Vietnam vets in their 60s and 70s to high school kids. But some of the older folks are already entrenched in their ways. They've already bought into the system for better or worse. And as you said, they got nine to five jobs. They don't have time to come home and to watch a video or to read a book and things like that. But this younger generation that has the technology in their hands and has the time to discover these ideas and are discovering these ideas, it's really going to create a whole new wave, a generation of people, not only around the United States, but the world that are going to reevaluate if they want to uh, inherit the things that their parents, you know, have bought into. If they want to go into that nine to five job, if they want to go into student loan debt, if they want to pursue corporate jobs and, you know, in the hopes that they're going to achieve happiness, or if they want to focus on themselves and achieving their own sense of happiness within themselves. So, I, I applaud you for your efforts, man. Uh, I want to give you a chance to let everybody know where they can find more of your work and more about what you're doing out there. Um, yeah, uh, you can find everything on uh, liberatervva.com. Um, everything's on the site. Uh, of course, the, the videos are very easy to find on there, too. And, yeah, I've, um, I've been kind of curious of, um, I guess, yeah, for me, for the most part, uh, anyone who comes as an anarcho syndicalist or anarcho communist I actually met maybe two anarcho-communists who would not initiate for some of me. 
so you know that took me by surprise. So it was a conversation I had like maybe two months ago. But they they were from North Carolina. They were just here visiting. Uh, so for me, I'm kind of open. This is I mean this group is open to any ideas, beliefs, religion, um, you know, any kind of background. Uh, you know, the only rule, of course, is you know that we will not uh, initiate. We will not finally enforce these ideas onto anyone. You know, so any of these ideas are more than welcome. Uh, my only thing with communism, again, is uh, each one I've run into so far uh, would advocate violence to finally force their ideas onto other people. And, you know, I'm more than open and more than uh, <laughs> to, to meet another communist maybe perhaps someday if I've come across one that says, yeah, all right, you know, it's, um, we, can, we can both work towards achieving that. Um, but for the most part, um, I'm, the invitation is still open. So I'm kind of curious, I guess, how you've kind of... Um, what do you guys just avoid sometimes to talk of like private ownership or uh, there? You know, uh, there, sometimes the conversation just doesn't come up. But I think you know our our group operates in the similar fashion to the way you're describing, uh, where it's open to anybody. We've had people come in and discuss their beliefs that are anti-capitalist, and then some people are anarchists. Others still fight within the political channels, but they appreciate the work we do. So we get all kinds of people, which is what I think you know we we both enjoy here, is because. I don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of robots. I'm not looking to create a society that's just a bunch of yes men or people who believe like me. I, want, I, I respect everybody's right to have their free own individual mind and to pursue freedom however that you know finds them. And I also appreciate the uh, the dialogue. So the, the conversations are there. They happen. And that's why regardless of any kind of uh, division or BS stuff that happens through the Internet or through the so-called liberty movement or even on a local level, we push forth and we work with whoever we can when we can. You know, I'm not going to get stuck on those those separations and those differences. But um, as far as the initiation of force, that has been my experience as well. That when it comes down to that certain point, there you know there is some like yeah you know we're friends and I get you on this point. But if there's ever my type of revolution, at some point you know there will be use of force and that you know and that may be against you. You know is kind of the the feeling I get there but I'm I'm hoping that through continuing to work together through continuing these conversations that we can come to a point and to establish uh you know some type of true understanding where those things won't even be involved anymore and who knows maybe eventually they'll come around to understanding that volu yeah. voluntary interaction is the best you know and give them time and that's usually what I do sometimes I have percentage wise like or right, maybe they, they understand me 75% 80% they're almost there sometimes they'll slip in like uh you know um like a, I guess like um, what we're calling like status fallback position. Sometimes you know, ah, oh, you're almost there. Um, yeah, so I've noticed this with time. People will come to understand a lot of this stuff. You know, and that's this with, with patience. Um, you know, you're given the information on their own, they'll they'll look into the matter even further. And I, I think it's pretty awesome that you're actually going out there and talking to some of these people too, because that's for the most part that's kind of I believe that's what's missing in, in the entire. You know, if anyone's talking about freedom, it's actually reaching out to your community and talking about freedom. Um, not uh, online is very important. Sure, the digital community is very important, but for the most part, I feel that that's pretty much where it's kind of stalled in a lot of different areas is online. And instead of trying to to go out, there are people who live near you. There's people who live in your own community, and uh, these are all potential anarchists out there. And all you have to do is just, just exercise your voice. Um, you know, the opposite of what government doesn't want you to do, right? <laughs> they want to say again, your voice is a paper, a chat, a lever. They're afraid of you use your real voice, and actually, you you find some common ground. Um, and to, to continue that discussion, you'll, you'll come to a better conclusion, come, go to a better place. So I think it's pretty cool that you're, you're doing that. Um, you know, aside from like, again, most communication is nonverbal. So you're, you're, a lot of the stuff when people talk about this stuff online is, is absent that. Uh, you, don't, you don't feel any kind of empathy. You don't see tone, hear tone, or um, any of that, uh, the stuff that's kind of, I guess, all, all the things that are kind of required of communication. You know, online is just to see, you know, fonts and periods and exclamation marks you don't see you know the emotion behind that you don't see uh the face behind that uh so yeah no that's that's pretty cool i, I think that's pretty awesome what they're doing there too uh, mm -hmm. i think that's i think the last key actually that's been missing for a long time to actually put this stuff forward out there um you know again it's if all we do is just watch and make videos you know it's not going to go anywhere <laughs> yeah exactly. uh, if you know unplug every once in a while and step outdoors uh yeah then we do stand a chance in actually realizing real freedom in our lifetime well, I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Cal, for taking time to us uh, to talk to us today. And as you said, and, and everyone listening, be reminded that all it takes is for you to grab a camera, walk outside, and go to your local shopping center or you know school or anything where you know there's going to be people and start a conversation. You know the 
the opportunities are there, and I find, and as, as Cal said, that I'm sure you will find that there are uh, fruit to bear in all conversations. You know, you go out there and you start a conversation with somebody, and before you know it, you've got a new partner and the fight for freedom. So stay involved and get out there and check out Liberate RVA. Thank you, Cal. Thank you, Derek. Take good care.